The previous 24 hours possibly mark the moment in the Ukraine war when the implicit recognition that the in the West that the war in Ukraine is not going well and that the prospects now are becoming bleaker well that implicit recognition which I suspect has been circulating and which has been discussed privately in the corridors of the various chancelleries in the West and in the foreign ministries and the defense ministries and amongst the intelligence agencies anyway yesterday looks like being the moment when it finally went public and it went public in an article that appeared in CNN which I will come to shortly but before I do that and before I discuss that article in detail and its implications it might be useful again just for clarity to summarize the situation on the battlefronts and here the situation is as it has been now for several weeks indeed to a great extent since the offensive began though all of the all of the facts all of the reports point to a very significant reduction in the intensification of the fighting now before I proceed, I should say that I've had um, some helpful comments from uh, a Russian um, um, email correspondent who has um, corrected me about my pronunciation of some of the names, the place names um, in this fighting. I will try to follow the corrected pronunciation and should apologize for my mistakes in the past but on that basis let me now proceed to go over what it seems to me has been the case on the battlefields over the last 24 hours now once more there were more ukrainian attempts against the village of rabotino um, south of orechov in the zaporozhye sector this was supposed to be i think the main axis of advance this is the area where the russian the ukrainians were going to break through the russian defenses towards topmak and then eventually to that town which i have pronounced as a greek word melitopol but which apparently in russian is pronounced miletopol <laughs> anyway there we are so this has been the uh, main axis or intended main axis of advance this is where most of the pictures of the leopard twos and the bradleys burning on the steppe lands that's where most of these pictures come from in this particular sector and as i said yesterday there were more attacks towards robotina and there have been apparently more attacks today but all of the attacks yesterday were unsuccessful the Ukrainians launched these attacks. They were driven back to their start lines. They made no progress at all in the Rabotino area. The only thing that they achieved there was to suffer further losses. Now, further east, we have continued fighting in, again, the area which I've been referring to as the Bremevka Ledge, but which I'm told should be correctly pronounced Vremevka, Le Vremevka and it's apparently not a ledge but a salient so the Vremevka salient anyway <laughs> again more fighting um, near Staromayorsk a deserted village now and also around this other village the village that lies beyond Staromayorsk, the village of Urajainaye. And this particular village has been the subject of many intense attacks by the Ukrainian forces over the last 24 hours. And there's some reports that the attacks, these attacks are continuing. And 
going back to an article written by David Sachs in David Axe, sorry, in Forbes. All of the troops that are taking part in the fighting in this area of the Vremovka salient um, are apparently Marines, or at least the bulk of them are, um, and Ukraine has concentrated all four of its Marine brigades in this particular sector of the battlefield, a very, very narrow sector, as they're trying to break through um, and capture Ura Zhainaye, or at least push the Russians out of Ura Zhainaye, so that they can then push on south, southeast, when of course they will eventually hit the major Russian defences, which constitute the so-called Surovikin line. I should say that the expression Surovikin line there's not, is not an official Russian one. It is one which is widely used by Russian reporters and Russian bloggers, and I've adopted it because um, it was General Surovikin who back in October spoke, spoke about creating fortified lines and fortifications, though um, a Russian general, um, a retired general, has now come forward and said that it's an error to attribute, attribute all of these fortifications to General Surovikin, though he is indeed a very talented commander, as this uh, Russian officer was careful to explain, and that at least as important as the density and complexity of the fortifications that have been created and which are associated with his name is the fact that following the withdrawal of Russian troops from the west bank of the Dnieper um, in Kherson city and such places, the densities of Russian troops that are holding the line in Zaporozhye region have increased markedly well beyond the accepted Soviet era norm. So this is what we're told. Perhaps it shouldn't officially be called the Surovikin line, but I will continue to refer to it as such. Anyway, the key thing to say is that the fights for control of Ura Zhainaye apparently continue. It hasn't so far been captured. There are some um, Russian commentators who think that perhaps in a week or so the Russians will decide to pull out of this particular village, just as they have with the case of Staromayorsk, that it's probably too costly and expensive to defend. Uh, additional fortifications ahead of the Surovikin line are created behind it. But anyway, for the moment at least, it remains the case that Ukraine has not captured this village. And as has now been said by several people, myself, a commentator I remember reading on Slavyangrad, a anonymous commentator writing on a thread, now the Russian commentator Yuri Podolyaka has also said it. So long as Ukraine is bogged down trying to capture these small deserted villages, these relatively small settlements, it's not achieving anything of significance. It's certainly not achieving breakthroughs. And whilst it remains bogged down in this kind of war, one has to say that its offensive overall is failing. And this is now as we shall see, becoming a consensus. So, no progress near Rabotina, no progress on the Vremovka ledge, apparently, no progress at the western end of the Zaporozhye front lines, a Piatihatki either. Now, there was something of an intrigue over events there yesterday because reports uh, circulated early in the morning yesterday that 
a Ukrainian force and managed to cross from the west bank of the Dnieper to the east bank, that they'd embedded themselves in certain in a, in a, in a village in Kherson region, uh, on the east in the part of Kherson region under Russian control, on the east bank, and having established themselves there, they were proving difficult to drive out. And this village, as I understand it, its name can be translated into English as the Cossack camps. Anyway, reports then started to appear from um, Russian officials, I discussed them yesterday, that actually this attack had been repelled, that the Ukrainian troops who'd landed there had been driven out. But there were contradictory reports, which started to appear later, principally from Ukrainian sources, which insisted that the village was indeed under Ukrainian Troll, and that in fact the Ukrainians were pushing forward from that village and were in the process of establishing a bridgehead on the east bank of the Dnieper in Kherson region. And as I've discussed in the past, if you actually look at the map and see where Piatikhatki on the southern front lines is, it's somewhere to the north of where this latest fighting on the east bank of Kherson region is, but you can see how it might make sense if the Ukrainians can capture Piatikhatki and then drive south and smash through the um, Surovikin line in this area, that they might potentially link up with a bridgehead established by the Ukrainians on the east bank on the east bank of the Dnieper in Kherson region, and that that might, in theory at least, become something of a threat to the Russian position in Kherson region and indeed in southern Ukraine. Well, anyway, the question of who actually controls the Cossack camps has now been conclusively resolved. A Russian correspondent, Natalia Gravchikova, has now visited the um, Cossack camps. She, uh, there's actually video of her doing so. She's in you know, flak jacket and helmet, and there are, she's escorted by Russian troops. But it is now absolutely clear that the Ukrainians do not control the Cossack camps. It remains firmly under Russian control. Seems a small number of Ukrainian troops did land on the east bank, we might be talking about between 20 and 40 people. They approached this village. They might conceivably have entered it, but they were very quickly driven out. And the village, which appears to be deserted, by the way, um, is at any rate, for the moment, firmly under Russian control. The one thing I would say is that there's clearly artillery exchanges continuing in this area. The Russians are shelling Ukrainian positions on the West Bank. The Ukrainians, for their part, continue to shell the Russians in this area as well. So this is a place which it would be most unwise for civilians to stay. But it's now clear that the Russians control the Cossack camps and that Ukraine has failed in its attempt to establish a bridgehead east of the Dnieper, that that attack was unsuccessful. And there's also been reports about Ukrainian attacks, continued Ukrainian attacks in the Bakhmut area. They seem to have made more attempts to try and launch attacks in the Bakhmut area towards the village of Belkhovka, which is north of Artyomysk, the former Bakhmut, but also towards um, the village of Klesheyevka. It's another corrected pronunciation, by the way, which is to the southwest of Artyomysk. And again, fighting has been apparently fairly intense, but in all respects, Ukraine has once more 
failed to achieve a breakthrough. Things are basically as they were before the attacks began. Though the Russians do seem to anticipate more attacks towards Klesheyevka over the next couple of hours. But overall, it seems to be deadlock there as well, with perhaps the initiative gradually passing towards the Russians. Now, further north, in the area where the Russians are continuing their advance, there's been some rather intriguing news. There were reports that um, Ukraine has been obliged, was obliged to transfer two brigades to this particular area. And that might explain certain comments that uh, the Ukrainian Defense Ministry says that the Ukrainian Ukraine's overall military commander, General Zaluzhny, made to General Milley, the chair of the US Joint Chiefs of Staff, in a recent call when he said that the situation on the northern front lines um, was under control. Ukraine, the Ukrainians had it under control. They were actually repelling Russian attacks in this area. That these two brigades, presumably, that had been rushed to the scene, had managed to contain the Russian advances. This has been disputed by Russian commentaries. They report that the two brigades, these two Ukrainian brigades, have indeed attempted to slow and even push back the Russian advance, that they've engaged in counterattacks, but that all of these counterattacks have been unsuccessful and that the Russian advance continues even though it can still continues in a slow, gradual and incremental way. Now, yesterday, there were also reports that a particular village called, I believe, Sinkova, which has been intensely fought over in this area for some time now, that a Ukrainian brigade maybe one of these two, which was defending Ukrainian positions in this particular village, has now pulled out of it, and that the village is now in the grey zone, with the Russians advancing towards it, and perhaps likely to occupy it soon. Again, if this is true, it is interesting. There's no confirmation of that that I'm aware of from the Russian Defence Ministry. And though this is a village that has been coming up often in the latest reports, I'm not entirely clear as to its location on the northern front lines. As I've said many times, I'm not the best person to go to if you want explanations of what's happening by reference to maps. But what I can say is that the two sides both seem to have attached some importance to the control of this particular village. But whether the Russians are going to capture it over the next couple of days, that, as I said, remains to be seen. So overall, this is where the fighting has been. Apparently, the situation in Avdeevka, Marinka, Vuglada remains relatively static. The Russians are mainly focused at the moment on repelling Ukrainian attacks and, as they like to say, grinding the Ukrainians down as the Ukrainians attack towards them. But they are continuing this gradual advance on the northern front lines, or at least that is what they claim. Now, I would add that even as the Russians are repelling attacks and are preventing the Ukrainians advancing to the point where the Ukrainians have still not reached the Surovikin line, there are reports that they are continuing to build defensive barriers 
of the same level of complexity and density as the Sudovikian line in other areas. And I saw a report that this is still happening in the Zaporozhye area, which is very interesting, but also apparently in southern Donetsk, presumably um, near Vugladar, and perhaps also in case of any potential Ukrainian breakthrough through the Vremevka led, uh, uh, salient. But also, I suspect, and this has been sort of confirmed in various places, in and around Artyomovsk, the former Bakhmut, so that if, say, Klesheevka does eventually fall, the Russians have strong lines of defense behind it, preventing the Ukrainians from achieving their objective of capturing or recapturing Artyomovsk, which would then, of course, become Bakhmut again, were it to happen. And in fact, I discussed a recent article which has appeared in the American media, it was there in one of my recent videos, in which was essentially an admission that Ukrainian forces in the Bakhmut area are suffering too many losses and are not strong enough, are not numerous enough, and are not well equipped enough and remain outgunned and therefore are most unlikely to be able to recapture Bakhmut. So, overall, an offensive which has ground to a stop and of which there is little sign that there is any serious advance. And I said that there have been some very interesting, one very interesting article which has appeared on CNN and which has attracted a huge amount of attention um, and which has been republished by sections of the media in Europe, including, by the way, the Daily Telegraph. I'll come to that in a moment. But before I do so, I should say that there was a further article in the Wall Street Journal, and it's a rather interesting article because its title, as is so often the case, puts an optimistic spin, which isn't really supported by its content. It says, US made cluster munitions fuel Ukrainian counteroffensive. Bombs are destroying Russian trenches and artillery systems in an area where Kiev's troops had struggled to advance. And as I said, the article attempts to present this as a evidence that these cluster munitions are somehow changing the pattern of the battlefield, which, to be frank, is not true. We see that the reality is that Ukraine is at a standstill. But slipped into this article is the first proper admission I've seen so far in any article I've read in the Western media of the simple fact that nowhere, in no part of the front lines, have the Ukrainians so far reached the Surovikin line. The closest place where they have got to achieving that is the area of the Vremevka salient. But even there, as of the time of making of this program, they haven't, they haven't managed it. And of course, if they do battle through and reach the Surovikin line, well, that's when their major problems are going to begin. And this is now when, where I come to the article that appeared on CNN. And it already has a bleak title. West no longer expects Ukrainian breakthrough on battlefield before cold weather and fears accusations. So, an open admission there that the... Western governments have given up hope 
that the offensive will achieve a breakthrough. It will not reach the Sea of Azov, Azov, sorry, the Sea of Azov. It will not break through. It will not cut the Russian land bridge in two. It doesn't look likely that it's even going to achieve the recovery of any significant territory. And it's looking unlikely that it will result in the recapture of even a part of Bakhmut. And the article then goes on to say that officials in Ukraine's partner countries have become increasingly aware of the growing <coughs> unrealism of their initial expectations for the Ukrainian counteroffensive, no longer anticipating major progress on the battlefield by autumn and fearing a blame game on Ukraine's part. Following weeks of Ukraine's much anticipated counteroffensive, Western officials are receiving increasingly sobering assessments of the potential of Ukrainian forces to take to retake significant territory from four senior US and Western officials familiar with the latest intelligence told CNN. Now these are obviously serving officials, obviously they're not identified. And the article goes on to quote one of them as saying, they're still going to see for the next couple of weeks if there is a chance of making some progress. But for the Ukrainians to really make progress, that would change the balance of this conflict. I think it's extremely highly unlikely. And that was one, one, one of these officials who were told is a senior Western diplomat has now told CNN. And then there's a quote of somebody who's clearly not one of these officials. He's a congressman, Mike Quigley, a Democrat from Illinois, who's apparently listened in to some of these um, um, briefings. And he says, our briefings are sobering. We're reminded of the challenges they face. This is the most difficult time of the war. And then the CNN report goes on to say the main challenges for Ukrainian forces remains breaking through Russia's multi-layered defensive lines in the country's eastern and southern parts, covered with tens of thousands of mines and an extensive network of trenches. And the, um, there's an admission that the Ukrainian army has suffered staggering losses pushing the Ukrainian back, U command to hold back some units to regroup and mitigate losses. In other words, some Ukrainian units have been so badly beaten in the fighting, their losses have been so high that the Ukrainian military leadership has been obliged to pull them out of their front lines, back to the rear, so that they can be reconstituted with fresh equipment and fresh reinforcements, fresh, freshly enlisted Ukrainian troops. Some of them will not, of course, or most of them will not, of course, have had the benefit, if that is what it is, of Western training. Anyway, then, then, then there's a quote from a senior Western diplomat. The Russians have a number of defensive lines and they, Ukrainian forces, haven't really gone through the first line. Well, we see Wall Street Journal is admitting they haven't even reached the first line. But this senior diplomat says, well, they haven't even actually managed to break through it. And then he goes on to say, even if they would keep on fighting for the next several weeks, if they haven't been able to make breakthroughs throughout these last seven, eight weeks, what is the likelihood that they will suddenly, with more depleted forces, make them? Because the conditions are so hard. And then there's a report from another official, and this time we're told that this is a US official. And he is slightly more hopeful than the others. Perhaps he comes from the State Department. Um, but even he is talking in somewhat subdued terms. 
we all recognize this is going harder and slower than anyone would like, including the Ukrainians, but we still believe there's time and space for them to be able to make progress. But then we learn many officials said the coming autumn, when weather and combat conditions are expected to deteriorate, leaves Ukrainian forces with limited time to make headway. And the article continues, Western officials say the slow progress exposes, exposes the complexity of transforming the Ukrainian army into a combined mechanized fighting force, often with only eight weeks of training on tanks and other new weapons systems supplied by the West. Which is, of course, partly true, though I doubt that it's the only problem. But, of course, it's a point that's been highlighted by many people. Brian Baletic has been discussing the training problems, well, for at least a year now. And um, we've also been discussing these problems, Alex Christopher and I on the Duran, and I've highlighted them on this channel. It's rather late in the day for senior US officials to be recognizing that these problems exist. But there we are. They are now recognizing them and then they are talking about them. And then we go on to read Western officials say, um, uh, sorry, a senior US military official suggested that the lack of progress on the ground is one of the reasons why Ukrainian forces are increasingly striking Russian territory to try and show Russian vulnerability. Now, again, on this channel, my channel, also in my discussions with Alex Christoforo on the Duran, I've been we've been saying this for months, these Ukrainian pinprick attacks, these drone attacks on Moscow, these assassinations of um, people who are of no particular significance in the Russian political system, but who are known, fairly well known in Russia. Um, these drone attacks on Russian shipping in the Black, Black Sea, they're not part of some overall Ukrainian military strategy. They're merely, essentially, public relations exercises to keep alive the impression that Ukraine is strong and Russia is weak. And here we finally have a US military official telling CNN the same thing, that the lack of progress on the ground is one of the reasons why Ukrainian forces are increasingly striking Russian territory to try and show Russian vulnerability. And the article continues. CNN says the latest estimates are a significant change from the optimism seen at the start of the offensive. These officials say those expectations were unrealistic and are, and are now contributing to pressure from some in the West to start peace talks, including territorial concessions. And then we go back to Congressman Quigley. He's quoted as saying, Putin is waiting for this. He can sacrifice bodies and buy time. Well, Ukraine is sacrificing many more bodies and is losing time. And then the officials say that they're concerned that the widening gap between expectations and results will lead to a blame game between Ukrainian officials and their Western backers, possibly generating friction within an alliance that remained largely intact for almost two years after the war began. And then we have a direct quote. The problem, of course, here is the prospect of the blame game that the Ukrainians would then blame it on us. And, of course, again, I have been talking about the fact that recriminations have been underway. Actually, they've been underway for some time. The West says it's all the fault of the Ukrainians. 
they haven't followed the combined arms tactical playbook that the West tried to get them to adopt. They haven't listened to the West's advice. They haven't trained sufficiently or properly. Whereas the Ukrainians are saying that it's because the West hasn't provided them with the weapons they need. And in fact, there's a quote here in the same article from Zelensky. We plan to start the counteroffensive in the spring, but we didn't because, frankly, we don't have enough ammunition and weapons and we don't have enough properly trained brigades. I mean, properly trained in operating these weapons. So that's it. They're now worried that failure is going to result in a blame game, each side blaming the other for failure but the Ukrainians in particular, blaming the West for the lack of ammunition. And there, at that point, with that, with that last comment by Zelensky, this article in CNN ends. Now, notice the enormous gap following this article. It doesn't consider what the consequences of the failure of this offensive might be. It doesn't really get into a proper discussion of this. It admits that there's pressure from some people in the West to engage in negotiations, but it's also clear that there is an enormous amount of resistance to that still, both, of course, in Ukraine and elsewhere. So. For the moment, there is no sign of the West really embracing negotiations, despite the attempt by some people, um, by some people uh, centered around the Council for Foreign Relations to undertake at least an outreach. And I've discussed how there have been informal talks between people at the Council of Foreign Relations and Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov at the, at New, in New York in April during the General Assembly session and how there have been private 1.5, I mean, tier 1.5 talks in Moscow as discussed in that article in Moscow Times, though those talks aren't going very far. And Jeff Roberts the British historian, um, or perhaps I should say the Irish historian, who has um, who regularly circulates articles to a privileged community of people of whom I'm proud to say I am one. Um, he's provided a deeply dis depressing article um, by um, Dominic Sansome, in the national interest, one of the other big heavyweight media publications in the West which cover foreign policy, the three elite ones are foreign affairs, foreign policy and the national interest. This one came up in the national interest and he discusses the splenetic response to the article by Samuel Charab, one of the people connected with the Council for Foreign Relations, one of the authors of the important RAND report. In fact, I believe there are now two, though I've only seen one. RAND reports that talk about the dangers of a prolonged war for the United States, and the author of an article, an unwinnable war, Washington needs an end game in Ukraine, which appeared in Foreign Affairs, which basically sets out the thinking of the people at the Council for Foreign Relations about the need for negotiations. And this is this very moderately worded, this um, article that basically suggests talks, but without, in truth, offering the Russians
anything that they might be interested in. It might, might make them interested in agreeing to, um, in either agreeing to those talks or in agreeing to a diplomatic solution. But anyway, even this article has provoked a furious reaction. So we've had uh, an angry article appearing apparently in foreign policy, foreign affairs. First one by Dmitro Natalucha, who's clearly Ukrainian. He's the chair of the Committee of Economic Affairs of the Parliament of Ukraine and a member of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. And he, um, um, he criticizes um, this article by Charib. He says that um, if you allow Russia to retain control of even a millimeter of Ukrainian territory, that will simply lead inevitably to a further war. And what needs to happen is that there must be a complete change in Russia. And the article apparently includes words like Ukraine and its allies must aim to make Russia less Western, less anti-Western, sorry, regardless of what happens at the negotiation table, Putin cannot remain in power. So there has to be outright regime change in Russia. And then we've had a further article um, from um, people like Apparently, um, Alina Polyakova, David Fried, and we're told that they're firm in the conviction that all that stands in the way of total victory is a lack of F-16s and long-range missiles, and that if prov what, what needs to happen is for there to be an escalation in military supplies to Ukraine, and that will eventually resulted the land bridge to Crimea being severed and that this would place Russia in an untenable position. And then we um, have further articles that even risking nuclear war, these are all apparently articles in the foreign affairs, risking nuclear war is apparently um, not something that should deter the West from further support for Ukraine. We apparently there's an article by someone called Angela Stent that Ukraine that Ukrainian forces remain upbeat in the battle for national survival. Russian troop morale is dwindling and that all that needs is for the West to continue indeed escalated support and Moscow's war machine will buckle under the weight of its own incompetence. And um, going back to Polyakova and Fried, they look forward not only to Russia's military defeat on the front lines in Ukraine, but to a political crisis in Russia, and one which might result in Russian political collapse with all the advantages to the West that is supposed to accrue from that. And anyway, lots of articles like this, all furiously denouncing Samuel Charib, or at least criticizing Samuel Charib, and his suggestion that negotiations take place. And as um, Mr. Sanso points out, Dominic Sanso points out, what well, none of these articles recognize other ch changing realities on the ground. They continue to talk about the prospect of Ukrainian, Ukraine achieving some sort of victory on the back battlefield, some sort of breakthrough of Russia being defeated militarily. They seem oblivious to the reality that the offensive, Ukraine's offensive, is at a standstill as that article on in CNN discusses, they are incapable, it seems, of rethinking their strategy if a problems exist. 
they are prepared to agree with Ukraine that the reason that this is, these problems exist is not because the Russian army is proving a far more difficult opponent than many people in the West had imagined it to be. It is not because um, Ukraine's forces are incapable of winning a war against a far more powerful opponent. It is because the West, the United States, has not supplied Ukraine with all the weapons it needs. And we go back to that article in CNN. It's clear that what some people in Washington are worried about is that the people in the West who say that Ukraine's failure is due to an inadequacy of Western military supplies are going to link up with the Ukrainian government, which makes the same criticism, and that that will expose the administration and other Western officials who have struggled to find the weapons that Ukraine needs and are faced with a crisis of dwindling supplies. Something, by the way, which all of these critics also seem unable to recognize. Anyway, I've discussed these articles. I've discussed this article in uh, The National Interest. It's, it actually makes rather grim reading. But there's an even more astonishing article that's appeared in the Daily Telegraph. And this is by David Axe, who I presume is one and the same David Axe, who tells us that, um, who has pointed out that on the Vremevka salient, Ukraine has been obliged to commit all four of its marine brigades, and that it might suffer serious problems in this sector if those brigades become so depleted that they have to be replaced by less well-trained troops. Anyway, same David Axe who's writing that in the in Forbes has written a most extraordinary and in fact rather disturbing article in the Daily Telegraph. And what makes this article in the Daily Telegraph by David Axe so disturbing? Well, and not just its contents, but the fact that again it refuses to acknowledge the battlefield realities. It is published by the Daily Telegraph simultaneously with the Daily Telegraph's reprint of large sections of the CNN article, which I discussed previously. But perhaps most frightening of all, that it looks forward with equanimity to the possibility of nuclear war and the extinction of humanity. Now, I say that because that is exactly what it does. First of all, it cannot acknowledge the reality of Ukrainian defeat. So the article says this, Ukraine is winning a crucial part of the land war. It's nuclear button time for Putin again. Vladimir is terrified and know, knows he is beaten. His nuclear posturing confirms it. And David Axe obviously must know that the reality, the actual reality on the battlefield, points in a completely different direction. It's not that the Ukrainians are winning the land war. It is that the Ukrainians are losing the land war. But then he talks about why the West should continue escalating. It should continue to provide Ukraine with everything that it needs to continue the offensive. It wants the West to put aside any doubts. Um, and it finishes in this way. Even if there's an edge of insanity in Putin's deepening des desperation, the United States and its NATO allies shouldn't bow to nuclear threats. If Putin 
could merely say through Medvedev the word nuclear and get his way. He would say nuclear all the time and march his army across Eastern Europe, its troops shielded by their leader's atomic threats. And then he says, this is David Axe, says Medvedev is afraid because Putin is afraid. That fear makes them reckless with their words, but it doesn't make them suicidal. And then comes the astonishing last paragraph. And if I'm wrong, it doesn't matter. If I'm wrong, then Putin was ready to end the world after any defeat. And if that defeat didn't come in Ukraine, it would eventually come somewhere else, which means Armageddon has been inevitable since 1999 which is the year, of course, when Vladimir Putin became Deputy Prime Minister, or at least Acting Prime Minister of Russia. So let's not worry about risking nuclear war. Let's not worry if uh, whether or not Putin is bluffing. Probably we like to think that he is bluffing, but if we're wrong, and he's not bluffing, then it doesn't matter if, it's, if there's nuclear war, if humanity or human civilization is completely destroyed, because sooner or later that terrible man in the Kremlin would have launched Armageddon anyway. Well, in his article, um, Derek Sanson in the National Interest talks about the extraordinary visceral hatred for Putin that exists among some people in the West and how that is distorting all their thinking and reason. I think David Axe's article is yet a further stark example of this. It does show the astonishing risks that some people are prepared to take in order to pursue this Ukrainian enterprise. They're quite open, at least David Axe is quite open, that he's prepared to risk World War III. And he says if World War III happens, don't blame him, blame Putin instead, because it's his fault that he didn't just back down. Well, I mean, this sort of thing leaves me speechless and it illustrates, to my mind, where the real danger of nuclear war is coming from. Now, what is going to happen? I, too, think that there is little prospect of Ukraine achieving a breakthrough over the next few weeks. Um, CNN acknowledges what, in fairness, others have now also been acknowledging um, in mainstream media, that Ukraine is now running out of time. It is also running out of resources as well. And another article that Jeff Roberts circulated is an article by, the, um, um, by Michael Vlachos, who is a senior fellow at the Institute for Peace and Diplomacy, and who, by the way, um, conducted some months ago an extremely interesting interview of Colonel Douglas McGregor, in which they discussed uh, what the situation at that time was um, in the Ukraine conflict, and which interview has proved to be extremely, extremely prescient in many respects. Anyway, Michael Vlachos is now talking about the real possibility, the real prospect, not just of a Ukrainian defeat, but of a Ukrainian military collapse. And he says things like this, a defeated army and a broken one are two different things. <clears throat> 
An army merely defeated in battle can often make successful withdrawals, reform itself and reconstitute its strength. After Rome did, after its humiliation at Cannae, eventually destroying its great rival Carthage. But when whole armies break, when they lose their will to fight, the whole nation can likewise break. That is what happened to the great empires in World War I. It is also the fate awaiting the Ukrainian army. And then he goes into a detailed discussion about how that happens. And he speaks about um, part of what breaks an army is attrition, which results from both casualties and the trauma that comes along with battlefield losses. Trauma among the still living wears them down. And we are indeed getting lots of evidence of such trauma um, amongst people in Ukraine. Um, the vitality as a fighting force leaks out from those untouched as much as from the wounded, as ardor and hope, the energies on which combat performance depends, keep seeping out. How much wearing down can an army take before it breaks down? And then he asked, that's a question. Hence, attrition is wearing down both physically and psychologically. Uh, a million or so served in the Confederate Army. 350,000 died, and another 200 or so were wounded. This was truly mind-bending attrition. Half of all men who fought for an army that, in the end, yielded to the Union still unbroken. Their captain surrendered rather than fight a lost war, and soldiers who would have followed him to hell laid down their arms. By contrast, from 1914 to 1918, six of seven great power armies broke down, leading to mutinies, surrenders and revolutions. The battle losses were staggering, though none approached the Confederate apocalypse, amounting to 5.38% of the South's population. Germany lost 3.1% of its population. France lost 3.6%. However, casualties are only part of the attrition equation. Over time, they drain the ardour and hope that peak when war is first declared before war is spilled. Yet even an exhausted and dispirited army will keep fighting as long as its soldiers can remain committed to the cause. Yet commitment will flag and then fail if when three other factors on, on, unfold. And these are negative feedback, bellows, inflaming, an already dire situation. And the first is when the feeling starts to take hold that the war, in which there were high hopes, suddenly starts to look unwinnable. And Michael Vlachos suggests that this is what has happened in Ukraine over the last six, feet, six weeks. And um, that is affecting morale. There's little pro prospect that the morale itself um, can be restored because the attrition continues and the prospects of victory are dimming. The second is the continued effect of attrition. And he has reached a calculation, I'm not sure quite how he's achieved it, but he's reached a calculation that Ukraine has by now lost 2.4% of its population, 2.5% of its population in the war, which is it's losing people at a higher, faster rate than even Germany and Britain did during the First World War. And this is also becoming unsustainable and is also likely before long to lead to a collapse. And then he also says that a further factor is that the Russians, by contrast, are starting to become increasingly confident 
and that their forces are approaching a position of a possible surge. So a collapse, Ukrainian collapse over the time horizon, he says that might happen at any point starting from about three months on his expected time window is three to six months. I'm going to say that, in my opinion, Vlachos is overestimating the prospects of this at the moment, though I'm not in a position to say that he's necessarily wrong. But perhaps a Ukrainian collapse rather than a Ukrainian defeat, mere defeat, is indeed now starting to come over the horizon. After all, there have been collapses in recent American wars. South Vietnam collapsed in 1975. Afghanistan collapsed in 2021. So perhaps we could see, over the next few months, a Ukrainian collapse. Um, in another one of his recent programs. Colonel McGregor has spoken about the fact that President Putin's reluctance to unre unleash the entire force of the Russian army against Ukraine is basically the only thing that is holding Ukraine together at the moment. And Colonel McGregor says that he is worried that Putin's reluctance to do this is because he is holding some of his military back in case of a Western escalation in Ukraine, Western in direct involvement in Ukraine, whereas in reality, Putin's reluctance to bring the war to a rapid end is precisely what is encouraging some people, like David Axe, for example, in the West, potentially, to call for direct Western intervention. Well, Douglas McGregor may be right about that, but I'm going to suggest that the more likely reason why Putin is not sending the entirety of the Russian army to finish Ukraine off in the next few weeks is not because Putin is not aware of the risks of Western intervention if he holds back, but rather because the Russian military at the moment doesn't feel fully ready to conduct the kind of knockout blow that Colonel McGregor um, is referring to. There are still hundreds of thousands of men going through the training process and who are still enlisting. The arms factories in Russia churning out weapons, but they still need to churn out more weapons to ensure that all of these men are properly equipped to um, engage with Ukraine going into the war. I think one important lesson that the Russians learnt from uh, what happened in the first two months of the war is that in order to win a clear-cut victory in Ukraine, they need to bring to bear overwhelming force. And sending an inadequately sized force to try to end the war quickly is more likely to result in greater losses and greater problems. And that it is this, this attempt to build up forces to the necessary scale to carry out that offensive. That is the true reason, not worries about Western responses, that Russia for the moment continues to hold back. But anyway, Vlachos is talking about a collapse. Douglas McGregor is saying that all the Russians need to do is to commit all their forces and something rather like the, the collapse that Michael Vlachos is talking about will happen. There doesn't seem to be any proper discussion of this, of these risks in the West, the dogma still remains that if the offensive doesn't succeed, there will be a stalemate. And we've seen the enormous resistance that continues to be to 
the idea of any negotiation. Seems to me that a collapse is at least a possibility, and when I say a possibility, one that is likely to emerge over the next 12 months, and yet no one in the West seems to be preparing for it. Anyway, that I think is the situation that is going to persist for several months. Uh, Mordvichev was the most senior Russian commander to talk about Russian plans in the war, has said that he expects the Ukrainian offensive to have run its course by the end of August, that a long pause will then follow whilst the Russian build-up continues. Ukraine, of course, will try a build-up of its own, but compared to the one that Russia is undertaking, it will be a ramshackle affair, even allowing for this general mobilisation that President Zelensky is talking about. And then, at some point next year, the hammer blow will fall. And Mordvichev was discussing the war ending by spring, which would suggest a collapse in Ukraine by spring. So that's the possible Russian timeline. But we see that in CNN, from CNN, that the Western officials, even as they talk to each other, even as they now admit the failure of the offensive, they can't grapple with the consequences. They still find it impossible to make the kind of conceptual concessions to the Russians that are necessary to bring this war to an end before that possible Ukrainian collapse takes place. I cannot remember a bleaker period in diplomacy than this. Anyway, enough on Ukraine, a few further things to discuss. Um, the Chinese Foreign Ministry has still surprisingly not provided an official readout of the conversation between Wang Yi and uh, Sergei Lavrov, but there's been reports about it in the Chinese media, and I noticed that they use the formula that my Chinese correspondence, correspondent said to me was a more accurate translation of the Chinese word. The Chinese word that has been translated in the West as impartial, China taking an impartial view of the Ukrainian conflict the Chinese media is also using the expression fair and just, or just or fair, whichever you prefer. But anyway, it's one that is, you could argue, a little bit more sympathetic to the Russian position than the West would basically want to see. And whilst I'm talking about China, Russia, um, a joint Chinese-Russian task force has now sailed very close to the American-controlled Aleutian Islands. This has been seen by some people as an implicit warning to the United States, as a tit-for-tat against the fact that the US Navy sends its warships very close to um, Chinese and, by the way, also Russian territorial waters. They've been numerous incidents of that kind. Well, arguably, that is exactly what it is. But it's important to say that this was a small task force, around 11 warships in total. It's hardly a force comparable to a US Navy carrier task force. So it's perhaps a demonstration, but it is not the kind of show of force that the US Navy regularly undertakes and which has infuriated the Chinese and the Russians so much, though you would not think that from some of the reactions on the part of some people in Washington. But anyway, that's just to say I still don't think that the Russians and the Chinese have any plans for attack against the US 
mainland or any part of US territory. If there is going to be a war over Taiwan, it will be fought close to Taiwan and to the South China Sea. Now, I suspect that at this particular juncture, more concerning for the Chinese government is the situation in the Chinese economy, somewhat to my own surprise, but then I'm not an expert on Chinese economic matters. The expected rebound after the lifting of the pandemic restrictions, which I and others had anticipated at the start of this year, has failed to happen. And in fact, China is now experiencing deflation, an actual drop in prices, which is a sign that domestic demand within China is low. And the Chinese economy, economy can't substitute for low demand within China itself by increasing exports because there are now, as I've said many times, gathering signs that the West, not just um, Europe, but latest signs might even point to the United States as well, that the West is now moving towards recession. And I suspect that the recent rise in energy and food prices by cutting aggregate demand in the West further at a time when interest rates overall are still growing is going to add to the recessionary pressures in the West as well. So the result is that there's been a fall, sharp fall in Chinese exports which has been matched by a sharp fall in Chinese imports. All of this happening against a decline in demand in China itself, probably, as I said, a feedback loop from the fact that the export industries are not exporting enough at the moment and the lingering effects of the pandemic restrictions. So, I suspect that at this moment in time, Xi Jinping and the Politburo and the various officials in the Chinese government are mostly concerned about what to do about this. And I mentioned, um, I think it was yesterday, that I didn't think that the dismissal of the Chinese foreign minister, former foreign minister Xin Gang, was in any way connected with the parallel dismissal of the chief, the chair of the Chinese Central Bank. I think in some respects, in China, the dismissal of the Central Bank chairman is perhaps the more important indicator because I suspect that the reason the chairman of the Central Bank has been sacked is that he has been still resisting pressure to loosen Chinese monetary policy there's been concerns amongst many people in China that loose monetary policy has led to a significant build-up in debt and there's been concern to try and draw this debt down. Anyway, I suspect that the Chinese government, which shares the same growth obsession, if I can call it that, that Many governments around the world do, that they're becoming dissatisfied with this, that they feel that the time has come to loosen uh, monetary control, to increase money monetary money supply, to reflate the economy in some way, in order to achieve the 5.5% growth target that China has committed itself to achieving this year. So... I suspect that over the next few weeks and months, we will see a surge in spending in China. And that might have, of course, a further effect on oil and food prices. We shall see. But if it happens, well, we'll see what the general effect on the global economy of such a Chinese reflation would also be. So events Russian-Chinese relations as close or getting closer, Russia becoming an increasingly important trade partner 
for China, the Russians and the Chinese, basically sending a signal of their joint resolve through their naval exercises near the Aleutian Islands, but a Chinese government that is probably at this moment in time principally focused on economic issues. And growing uncertainty about what's going to happen in Niger. And the Russian government has now made a number of statements about the uh, Niger crisis. First of all, it's made absolutely clear that Russia is not involved. A uh, Russian foreign ministry spokesman, Alexei Zaitsev, has um, <coughs> directly contradicted Ukrainian claims <coughs> that Russia was in some way involved in the recent coup in Niger. Um, he's quoted as saying, it is pointless to comment. Ukrainian politicians change their statements 100 times a day. Even Western partners, who often criticize Russia without reason, have not said anything like this. There is no substantive background here. It's just empty talk. What the Russians have, however, also said is that they do not support an ECOWAS intervention in Niger. And Zaitsev speaking again said, we believe that a military intervention by ECOWAS in a sovereign state would hardly contribute to achieving lasting peace in Niger and stabilizing the situation of the subject region in general. We would like to point out that Niger's neighboring countries, including Mali, Burkina Faso, Chad and Algeria have ne reacted negatively to this scenario. Russia expects that a decision will be found through political and diplomatic efforts. That military intervention is not the right way. And it seems that opinion in Nigeria, by far the biggest West African country and the most important country, within ECOWAS is also now shifting to that view. It seems that the members of the president's party in the Nigerian parliament have spoken out against um, Nigerian intervention. There's also apparently growing protests against this intervention in Nigeria. It could be that Nigeria is gradually cooling on this idea. And I have to say, thinking about this, I think it's unlikely that Senegal and some of the other Francophone countries like Côte d'Ivoire would want to intervene in Niger by themselves if, I, if Nigeria was not there with them. So it could be that the prospects of an intervention by ECOWAS are now receding. There's apparently going to be an important meeting of ECOWAS tomorrow. We will see what the decision is and what they decide to do. Meanwhile, after Victoria Newland's disastrous visit, President, uh, sorry, Secretary of State Tony Blinken has called President Bazoum, the ousted president of Niger, the ousted civilian president of Niger. He's still on the phone. The US still seems to be trying to find some kind of mechanism to bring him back to office. Um, even as the prospect of an ECOWAS intervention recedes. Now, coming back to that, uh, coming back to the question of Victoria Newland's visit, it seemed to me that what she was trying to do was through threats and also it must be said through what came across to me as offers that could be construed almost as bribes. While she was in Niger, she tried to engineer splits in the Niger army, tried to win over some of the Niger military to the side of the West, of the ECOWAS states, to get the former president restored. And she seems to have come away frustrated because the people that she was talking to, the soldiers, the military leaders who she was talking to, who had been trained, by the way, by the United States, seemed unreceptive 
to all of this. Having said that, it's not to be discounted that something like that might happen. The pressure on Niger, the economic pressure, continues to be enormous. And of course, the threat of military intervention has not completely gone away. Um, it's possible that the Niger military might split. Anyway, we will see what happens. I'm not in a position to predict outcomes. One factor which should not be disregarded is public opinion in Niger. The Economist in Britain is saying that there's an opinion poll which says that 73% of people hold in Niger support the coup. But of course, I don't know how scientific or reliable that poll is. But if it's anything like that, that, that might explain why the Niger military are both holding together and holding firm. But that crisis is far from resolved. We will see what happens. But the big story, as I said, continues to be Ukraine. The West appears to have despaired of the counteroffensive. They have no military plan going forward. There's some people, like Mr. Axe, who are prepared to go as far as risk World War Three, Armageddon, as he puts it, but that's not obviously what Western governments are openly saying. There's no plan about what to do. And the prospect of a Ukrainian collapse is now being discussed openly by some of the more skeptical commentators. A bleak picture, a sad picture, but there it is. Well, that's where I end this video today. More from me soon. Let me repeat again, you can find all our programs on our various platforms, Locals, Rumble, BitChute, Odyssey, Rockfin, Telegram. You can support our work via Patreon and Subscribestar and by going to our shop and buying the magic mugs, t-shirts, sweatshirts, hoodies, all of those great things you will find there. Links for all of these under this video. And last but not least, if you've liked this video, please remember to tick the like button and to check your subscription to this channel. That's me for today. More from me soon. Have a very good day.